Hey guys, welcome back to this video series on survival analysis. This next video is looking at survival and hazard functions, or just hazards in general. Now this forms a series of videos on survival analysis and you can see all of them up on zstatistics.com or in the description, I'll put a link to the playlist. But let's now dive straight in to survival and hazard functions and see how we go. So the first thing we'll do is get introduced to these four distinct functions. The first two of these you might have seen if you've looked at probability distribution functions before, that's the cumulative distribution function and the probability density function. And then we'll look at survival and hazard functions and see how they all interrelate. Now, after that, we'll actually learn how to interpret the hazard function or the value from the hazard function. We'll then learn about the cumulative hazard function. And finally, we'll look at the calculus behind the scenes. And I'll show you some examples of real world survival and hazard functions beyond the sort of simplistic ones that I introduced right at the very beginning. So before diving into those four functions, let's just remember from the previous video, we've already seen a survival curve before. Now this looks a bit more like a staircase than a curve, but that is what might be called a survival curve from a kaplan meyer estimator. But it's basically like a bespoke survival curve reflecting the underlying data itself. What we're gonna do in this video is actually find out ways of creating a survival function that is a smooth curve and better reflects the true nature of survival as time progresses. So here we go, let's see if we can do that with this very simple example. I've said here that people diagnosed with some disease, let's just call that disease X, they die uniformly within a five year window of diagnosis. So this is probably quite unrealistic, but again, it'll help us understand the relationships between these variables. So firstly, let's take the cumulative distribution function represented by capital F with T in brackets, the time being in brackets. Now, if, if people are dying uniformly within five years of diagnosis, it means that everyone dies within five years, but say 20% of people are dying each year after diagnosis. So, so after one year, 20% of people have died. That's 0.2 on the y-axis here. After two years, it's 0.4, etc., etc. Now, the important thing about the cumulative distribution function is that it starts at zero and finishes at one or 100%. So 100% of people have died after five years, which again is unlikely to be the case with any disease, but hey, it's gonna help us figure out these relationships. The probability density function is actually the gradient of the cumulative distribution function. Now, because this is a particularly simplified example, you can see we have a constant gradient so that the probability density function is in fact uniform. We're gonna be changing that up a little bit later in the video. And so to find the proportion of people that are dying within say one, two or three years, we just find the area under this curve. So you can see that the area from zero to one under this curve is gonna be 0 0.2. The area from say zero to three under this curve is gonna be 0 0.6. That would be that area of that rectangle underneath that curve from zero to three, meaning that 60% of people have died within three years of being diagnosed with this disease. Of course, the area under the probability density function has to sum to one for the same reason that the cumulative distribution function finishes with a Y value of one because 100% of people have died by the five years of this example. So now we get to the survival function. And all that is, is it's almost like the reverse of the cumulative distribution function. So the cumulative distribution function shows us what proportion of people have died at certain number of years from the diagnosis. So say at two years after diagnosis, 40% of people, that's 0 0.4, have died. The survival function tells us how many people have survived. So at the very beginning, there's 100% of people that have survived at the exact time of diagnosis, because we presume we're not diagnosing dead people. Uh, and after two years, you can see that the survival function gives us 0 0.6. 
So that means 60% of people have survived after two years. 40% of people have died, 60% of people have survived. So it is in fact just one minus the cumulative distribution function. Now the hazard function is probably the most interesting one. And to understand it, we have to take a look back at the survival function. And let's just say we've just been diagnosed with this disease. If I asked you, what's the probability that you will die within one year? You'd probably tell me that it's going to be 20% because 20% of people die within that first year. And you'd be correct. But let's say now I've actually survived three years already. If I've survived three years already and I asked you that question, what's the probability of you dying within one year? Hopefully you can see it's actually going to be 50% because there's only 40% of people left at this point. And if everyone dies within five years of diagnosis, it looks like half of those people alive at three years will have died by four years. That kind of means that your risk of death or hazard is actually increasing the longer you survive. And that's what the hazard function is actually mapping out. If you're still alive at four years and 11 months, by virtue of this model that we've created here, you are unfortunately destined to die in that last month, right? So the, the hazard's going to be extremely large for you as you get closer to five years. So there is a conditionality to this hazard function. It's conditional on having survived up until that point. So the way we calculate the hazard is simple enough. It's the probability density function divided by the survival function. So if we want to do a quick example, let's see if we can calculate the hazard at three years. So I'm just going to change the scale on this hazard function here. And you can see on the side now it's going from zero to one as opposed to, I think I had what, zero to eight before. At time three, the probability density function is 0.2. And if you divide 0.2 by the proportion of people alive, which is only 0.4, 0.2 divided by 0.4 ends up being 0.5. And again, you can see it time three, the hazard is 0.5. But how do we interpret that hazard? What does 0.5 actually mean? Let's find out in the next section. Interpreting hazards, here we go. Okay, so here we have the two versions of the hazard function that I showed on the previous slide. And a hazard itself can be considered as an instantaneous risk of the event occurring at any point in time. So we can see that at three years, we have an instantaneous risk of death of 0.5, whereas at four years, the risk of death is now one. So it's double the risk of death or double the hazard at time four as opposed to time three. But what is 0.5 and one? What do they actually mean? What are the units of hazard? Well, technically, it's kind of like the number of deaths occurring per year, which sounds a bit silly because you can only die once, of course. But if you think about, say, a video game character that can die and die again and keeps getting respawned, that's probably the easiest way of thinking about this. So it's a bit of a fiction, but at the same time, it does indicate to us that, you know, for all the people that have reached three years post-diagnosis, they're now dying at a rate of 0.5 deaths per year. And if you continue it along, you can see that, say, after four and a half years, it looks like we're at two deaths per year, which again, sounds a bit silly from an individual's perspective, but we're considering it to be the rate of death or the risk of death at any given point. And you can see that it goes up to very high values as we get closer to five years. And it'll actually be an asymptote there for this example, because again, it's a silly example, but everyone dies after five years in this one. So, the hazard has to increase to infinity at that point. All right, so it's time to meet the final of our fabulous five functions, and that is the cumulative hazard function. So here we go. Here again is our hazard function going from zero to four. I've cut it off at four because it gets a bit hard to read beyond that. So the hazard at zero is 0 0.2, 0 0.25 after one year, 0.33 approximately after two years, it's 0.5 at three years, etc., and one at four years. So what the cumulative hazard actually is, is the area underneath this curve from zero up until a particular point. And that's represented 
in calculus terms as an integral from zero to t of the func- of the hazard function. It's kind of measuring how the risk of death has accumulated as time continues. So at time zero, you've actually accumulated no hazard at that point. So your cumulative hazard at time zero is zero. The cumulative hazard at time one is the area underneath the curve there, which is approximately 0.22. Now, it's only slightly different to the hazard at this point, but the cumulative hazard will change dramatically shortly. So after two years, it's the area under that curve again, which is 0.51, it seems. That's the total hazard that has accumulated from time zero to time two. It's not the current risk of death per year, which is 0.33, but it's essentially how many deaths have accumulated by that point. And you can see that it's useful thinking of this video game character that can die numerous times. After three years, we've accumulated 0.92 deaths because that's the area under the curve. And you can see it's actually going to accelerate to 1.61, etc. And so we can actually map out the cumulative hazard over time and create another graph called capital HT, which is our cumulative hazard. And if I change the scale again from zero to six, you'll get a sense of how it works. So it does look a little bit like the hazard, but it will be a bit different. Now, the importance of the cumulative hazard might not be so apparent to you, but it will be really useful in using the cumulative hazard to derive all of the other functions. So we'll see how that works and how all of the functions relate to each other in a calculus sense right now. So... Uh, The first two functions, the cumulative distribution function and the probability density function, well, the latter is simply the derivative of the former. In other words, it's the gradient of the cumulative distribution function. And the cumulative distribution function is therefore the primitive or the integral of the probability density function. It's the area under the curve from zero to t. So what happens then when we look at the other functions? Well, the survival function is simply one minus the cumulative distribution function. And we saw that at the very beginning, noting that when 60% of people have died, we know that 40% of people have survived, right? Now, the hazard, again, we saw this in the first slide. It's the probability density function divided by the survival. So that's all well and good. But where does the cumulative hazard fit? Well, of course, it's the integral of the hazard function from zero to t, much like the cumulative distribution function was the integral of the probability density, the cumulative hazard is the integral of the hazard. But it also relates to the other functions and it does so like this. Okay, you ready for this? Check it out. The hazard itself is the probability density divided by the survival. We know that. That is the definition of a hazard. Now, we can keep going. We can look at the probability density and realize that that's the derivative of the cumulative distribution function. So, again, that's just a definition. Now, using the other definition, capital F, that's our cumulative distribution, is just one minus the survival. So, we have this interesting situation now on the numerator where we have the differential of one minus the differential of the survival. Now, The differential of a constant term is always going to be zero. So we can ignore that bit and it's just the negative derivative of the survival. So those that are familiar with a little bit of calculus can tell me that when you're integrating a function's derivative over itself, it actually ends up being the log of that function. So the cumulative hazard, funnily enough, is just the negative log of the survival function. And that's how it's going to relate to all of the other functions. If I zoom out again, you can get from the cumulative hazard to the survival and therefore from the survival to the cumulative distribution function. And from there, we can get to the probability density function. All right. So what we're going to do now is get out of this presentation software and into good old Microsoft Excel. And here we're going to look at uh, three example hazard functions that I've put together, one based on the uniform probability density function. And that's the one we saw at the beginning of the video. It's just 
purely for display purposes only, really. That's not something that's used, that tends to be used in reality. So you can see here, you can edit the cell and instead of having 0.2 as our uh, probability density value, we can make it 0.1 and it changes all of the other graphs there. And you can see that the uniform probability density, or the uniform function, when, when I described it as uniform, I was actually talking about the probability density function. That's what is uniform. And you can actually scroll down here and you've got the formula for each of the five functions that we've created throughout this video. Now, you can also have a look at the exponential one down here, down at the, um, the tabs at the bottom. We can have a look at what an exponential probability density function looks like. And if we scroll down, we can see that for an exponential probability density function, we actually have a hazard which maintains the same value all the way along. So it gives you a constant hazard providing an exponential probability density function. Now this is used quite a bit in reality. Um, just because you actually get a lot more flexibility with the kinds of curves that you can create. So if I change this from 0.5 to say 0.2, you can see it becomes a bit more shallow in terms of the, well, shallow in terms of the probability density function. Our survival function also has a bit of a curve to it. And the higher I make that, well, you can play around. You can play around with those values. And again, you've got the formula at the bottom there for exponential. Uh, the final one I've got here is a Weeble uh, probability density function. Now this has a lot of applications and is used quite often in engineering uh, because we get, again, more flexibility with the types of modeling we can do for our survival curves, our probability density functions, etc. Again, you've got the formula down there. So you actually have two different parameters of the Weeble function and you can see them at play in the formula down here. So have a play around with those and you can see we can get different types of distributions when we play around with these a little bit. Anyway, that's all up on uh, zstatistics.com. You can download this spreadsheet and edit it as you see fit, but hopefully that gives you a nice uh, connection between all of those functions that we were looking at at the beginning of the video. So that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed that. Again, all this is up on zstatistics.com plus a whole lot of other resources that you might enjoy. So check that out. Do the liking, do the subscribing. You know what to do. Uh, that does help out the channel and it allows me to make more videos if there are more people that uh, show me that that's worth it. And if you really want to show your appreciation, then please consider clicking the super thanks button at the bottom of this video. It allows you to donate money to the channel, which I'll be giving completely away to an education-based charity. And you can check in the description of this video to see which charity I'm currently donating to. So thanks to these guys for doing just that. And you are helping educate someone less fortunate than you. All right, I'll catch you next time. Thanks guys.